My name is Dr. Ralph Autumn. I'm a GP from Melbourne. I also have an associate professorship with the uh, University of Melbourne Department of General Practice. I have a real keen interest in chronic disease. And let me say, it's great to see so many of you showing an interest in COPD. Um, we have a whole lot of people also joining us online as a webinar. So I think there's another 200 or so that will be tuning in. So a great audience. So COPD, getting to grips with COPD. I mean, COPD, we know, is very common. It's often underdiagnosed, undermanaged, progressive. And we know it's serious. It can often have huge impacts on how people function. And it's the fifth leading cause of death within Australia. So, you know, it's an important topic. And tonight, we are really lucky. We have got four fantastic speakers. Now, you may be thinking, why med talks? Okay, so it comes out of an idea that we limit the time that the speakers have to 10 minutes. So in 10 minutes, they've got to get across what they think is important to you. So what I'm hoping then is that you will get a whole lot of crystallized ideas of what to take home to your practice. Because at the end of the day, this is about you, know, you making changes or us helping you make changes in managing COPD. It is so important. So please, you know, think as the speakers go through, think about what I can do within my practice. What things can I do come Monday? Now, just a bit of housekeeping. So please make sure your phone's either turned off or on silent. Um, no flash photography. This is being taped. Um, so it will be available on the website afterwards. There will be plenty of time for questions after the speaker. Remember, they only have 10 minutes each. So we, we do realize we have to give you time to ask questions. And we have a very innovative way of asking questions. But if you can't wait to the very innovative way of asking questions, we have this. So with your smartphone, you can log on to the slide.do website. And it, if you use the hashtag MedTalks, you can then enter your questions and it will come up to us. We'll then you know, alternate between questions from the floor and the questions that come through the online site. So, now to start. So the first speaker, Associate Professor Gary Kielov, um, a GP from Hobart, or from, sorry, from Launceston, but not say Hobart, from Tasmania. Um, he's been, you know, he's um, a, a, an educator with the National Associ uh, Association, was it? National Asthma Council, and he does also education um, around spirometry. He's done lots of articles around diabetes, respiratory disease, and obesity. Um, and I know him personally, so he's a, he's a fantastic speaker. And he'll actually be kicking the night off about sort of understanding a little bit about way, ways that people with COPD present. Gary. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Um, this is about clinching the diagnosis. Before we treat, before we investigate, we really need to make a clear diagnosis or at least have a notion of what we're going to, to, uh, to be addressing. So whilst this evening is about COPD, patients don't generally come to us with a diagnosis. They come to us with a set of symptoms that are causing them a concern or distress. They hope that we will provide them with a diagnosis and appropriate management and intervention. So with that in mind, I'd like you to meet Georgia. Georgia is a, a middle-aged lady who presents uh, for a health check at her husband's insistence. And her family has noticed that she's really slowing down. She's losing some of her function. She describes it as not being able to keep up with her kids, but in fact, it, it, it is more pervasive than that. If we then dig a little bit deeper, she has a smoking history, 27 pack years. She no longer smokes, but this is the accumulated damage over uh, a lifetime of smoking. She also has a family history of premature cardiovascular death. Her father died at the age of 58 years of age, only two years older than Georgia is now, which might have been a bit of a catalyst for uh, encouraging her to come in. If we have a look at a brief summary of her anthropometric and biometric uh, uh, numbers, you can see that this is a lady who has certainly features of the metabolic syndrome. So as generalists, and, and, and we as GPs are really the, the, the lone standing uh, health practitioners, at least doctors, 
who are true generalists. And as we, we deal with an aging population with more multimorbidity and more, more comorbidity, we need generalists more than ever. Now, you would be thinking, I imagine, be ticking over in your mind that this lady has risk factors for cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, and possibly other things as well, all of which could be contributing to her functional decline. So if we just think in terms of a practical way to analyze or practical way to tease out the contributors to dyspnea, and as you know, dyspnea is a subjective symptom of discomfort associated with breathing. We all become dyspneic if we run or if we, if we exert ourselves physically, that's normal. But dyspnea is really becoming breathless at, at work levels that shouldn't be causing distress. So of course, the first thing we need to think about is respiratory causes. Um, and, 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 and our lady, Georgia certainly has uh, um, some, some risk factors associated with that. The other is cardiac causes. These are the big ticket items that uh, have dyspnea as an associated and important symptom. And in both in respiratory and in cardiac symptoms, uh, in cardiac disease, the symptom of dyspnea is an independent, strong predictor of mortality in both of these. So this is not just a, a, a symptom of of displeasure, it is actually a poor prognostic feature. And because the, the, the risk factors for cardiac and respiratory overlap, so as an example, smoking is of course a major risk factor for both respiratory and cardiac disease. Another big one is age. The aging population is, has higher risk of cardiovascular disease, and I'll show you some of the figures in terms of respiratory disease. So think about both cardiac and respiratory. Unfortunately, getting one does not give you a ticket of leave to the other. And then finally, think about other causes that are neither respiratory nor cardiac. So some of the facts, and, and, and Ralph has already alluded to some of these, um, this is a common condition. About 2 million Australians suffer with COPD, and the prevalence increases with age. So it's about 1 in 7 individuals over the age of 40. And by the time we reach the age of 75, um, you can see that it's almost 1 in 3. Very common condition. Unfortunately, it is also underdiagnosed. Uh, around half the people are not diagnosed, and of those who are, many are actually misdiagnosed or symptoms are misattributed. And, and, and we'll discuss the reason for this briefly. 25% of smokers, so Georgia has been a smoker, 25% of smokers will develop clinically significant COPD in, in 25 years. Clinically COPD means people presenting with symptoms. These are people who are affected, whose function is affected. There would be more people who are affected if you simply went on, on, on pulmonary function testing. Because to become symptomatic, you lose about 50% of your airways before you, the airway function before you become symptomatic. An FEV1 of below 50% is when you start becoming symptomatic. Now, you might wonder why I presented Georgia rather than perhaps George. When we talk about COPD, often it invokes an image of the old cachectic man with nicotine stained fingers as your typical, your archetypal COPD sufferer. It may surprise you to know that the prevalence of COPD in women is greater than in men in Australia, as it is in some other uh, Western countries, liberal countries, where I guess social mores allow women to do the silly things that men are allowed to do. And in Australia, smoking is the leading cause or the leading risk factor for COPD. But just be mindful that on a global scale, the leading risk factor is in fact the burning of biomass. So if you have populations that are from um, uh, refugee populations or migrant populations, they may never have smoked, but they may have been exposed to significant toxins um, from burning fuels. And also there are a number of people who would be exposed to industrial um, uh, 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 industrial chemicals where perhaps protection was not as good as it should be. Many of us rely on clinical diagnosis and unfortunately clinical diagnosis has both low sensitivity and low specificity and, um, and, 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 and as I mentioned if we wait for symptoms to develop this is, this is a fairly significant progression of the disease. So in order to diagnose respiratory disease, we need specific investigations. And of course, the go-to test is spirometry, which we can all do in our practices. But if you don't do spirometry, or you're not good at spirometry, or you don't care about spirometry, make sure somebody else does it. Many respiratory physicians will have their own labs privately. Certainly the hospitals will all have respiratory labs. You can get spirometry done. And, and, and it, I, I, I'm 
I don't even know why I should be saying this to you, because if I was talking about diabetes and I said, well, you actually need to check people's blood sugar A1C before we diagnose diabetes, you'd think I was nuts. And yet we are happy to diagnose respiratory disease without doing a respiratory function test. We will commit people to lifelong treatment on a diagnosis based on a woman in prayer. Would you treat someone for hypertension without doing serial blood pressure measurements, home blood pressure, ambulatory blood pressure? Not in your life. But we do it for respiratory medicine. So just think, next time you have a patient with a diagnosis, see if you've got your respiratory test. If you haven't, shuffle them off for one or do one in your practice. Ralph already mentioned that this is a, a, a disease with very significant impact. <coughs> and the impact is both in terms of finances and of course main, main impact is, is, is the human cost. And I won't talk a lot about the personal impact because Joe will actually talk about, give the patient perspective on that. But I will sh just share a couple of things with you. In 2008, which is almost a decade ago, Access Economics did some financial modeling and they determined that the cost of COPD was an eye-watering $98 billion a year. Not million, billion. $98,000 million a year. The smallest part of that was actually the medical costs, about $8 billion. The rest was people retiring early, dying early, and shifting from being productive members of the community paying taxes and driving the economy to people who were invalided and relying on welfare and the economy looking after them. Now, I am going to share one um, aspect of the human cost and that is that in 2014 according to the ABS there were 15,276 deaths due to smoking related disease. This is more than breast, bowel, and prostate combined. And up until recently, we would screen for all three of those. And it may well be that we start screening again when some other figures around prostate come out, but that's for discussion for another day. But we don't screen for COPD. That kills more people than all of those combined. So how do we investigate? Well, of course, you guys know how to do it. We just need to make sure that we do actually do it. So as I mentioned, we look at respiratory causes. Spirometry is the go-to first test if you're looking at flow, uh, obstruction to flow. And as you know, COPD is a fixed airway obstruction. You can do more, more extensive pulmonary function tests like gas transfers. How well does do, do gas transfer across membranes? You can do um, a, a plethysmography, looking at lung volume, size of, of lungs. You can also do cardiopulmonary fitness assessment because often there are a number of co-contributing factors to try and tease out what, it, what, what contributes most to this person's uh, breathlessness. Uh, pulse oximetry available in all our practices. We shall all have a pulse oximeter. And, and of course, these are not e exhaustive lists. These are some of the things that we can all do. They're all available to us from primary care, either within our practices or certainly uh, an easy and quick referral. Just a reminder that chest x-ray is not a diagnostic test for COPD, but it is an essential part of investigation to exclude uh, or confirm complications of COPD, such as lung, you know, bronchogenic carcinoma or, or infections. What about cardiac? Again, you would be very familiar with a suite of investigations for cardiac disease. Um, you'd be looking at risk factors. You'd be looking at, at your ECG, I guess the equivalent of the spirometry in the respiratory realm. Uh, imaging, echoes, stress echoes, um, you know, uh, radionucleotide studies, uh, CT angiograms, the list goes on. Uh, and, and again, won't spend too much time talking about that. And then your non-respiratory, non-cardiac, things like anxiety, um, there might be anemia and many other things that could be part of this. And increasingly, we are seeing a population that is overweight and out of shape. And this certainly is a contributor, sometimes on its own, to breathlessness. Um, but often it'll be a, a, a co-traveler with many of the other conditions. So if there are any things I'd like you to take away from this evening, have a high index of suspicion. If we wait for patients to become symptomatic, we miss the boat. Remember, most smokers start their smoking career in adolescence. So a 15-year-old who may smoke regularly for 15, 20 years, 35-year-olds will have established COPD. If we wait for them to be 60, 
we've missed an opportunity to intervene. And when we look at some of the uh, uh, observational studies looking at clinical records about people's presentations and missed opportunities, somebody comes in, and I'm going to, uh, every one of us in this room, I'm sure, has had the patient who comes in and they need three or four courses of antibiotics for that chest infection that won't clear. If you remember that patient, make sure they get spirometry next time. So, proactively screen for, for, for risk. As we mentioned, one in seven over the age of 40 will have COPD. If you were to screen every patient over 40, your numbers needed to screen is seven. That's a whole lot bigger yield than for any of the other screening tests we do. And if you, and if you uh, uh, um, case find, in other words, if you specifically look for those people with a history of risk exposure or those who have persistent respiratory symptoms, your hit rate will be even higher than that. Now, of course, remembering that whilst tonight is about COPD, there may be many contributing factors. There may be many comorbidities uh, contributing to dyspnea. Make sure you find them all and treat the underlying conditions. Thank you. Very much following on from, from Gary's talk is that, yes, there are a lot of people out there with symptoms. And Gary made the really telling point, and it, it works out really well because I hadn't seen his slides before, um, before tonight, is that there's one other thing which we'll touch on in, in my presentation is not only might people not present with symptoms or we might not hear about it until they come within some sort of symptoms, but there's one level even below that is that do we even know what the symptoms are or more correctly what the symptoms represent so what you and I might consider to be short of breath might not be what somebody with COPD considers to be short of breath so Mr DT probably more the perhaps the quintessential patient that one might associate or think of as uh, a COPD because he's probably the male with the um, uh, not necessarily cachectic but um, maybe a few nicotine stains on the hand so 74 years old so not quite at the 75 where it's 29 percent but on his way there um, a smoker for 40 years uh, so again at a pack and a half per day for 40 years that's a lot of cigarettes over those years diagnosed with COPD at the age of 61 I think that's the first thing to say is that with COPD it is something that people will live with for a period of time so it's not necessarily that you get the illness and the next week or within you know 12 months that will be you gone so it is a, a condition that people live with and it does have an impact on their day-to-day -day life um, and it is to some extent subtle in that one day you're sort of diagnosed, for example, with having had a heart attack. You haven't had a heart attack the day before. Bang, it's hit you. Hits you like a, a brick wall. It may sort of encourage you or, or may encourage patients to make some changes because it suddenly hit them from out of the blue. Whereas with COPD, it is this more gradual onset of, of symptoms. It's not suddenly from one day to the next. And even when the diagnosis is made, it doesn't necessarily have quite the same uh, grab or quite the same um, brick wall effect as saying to somebody, we've got a diagnosis of cancer or you've just had a heart attack or you've had a stroke. Doesn't make it any less serious, but human nature being what it is, it's almost like the, uh, the old analogy of the, uh, the frog. Put it into boiling water, it hops out. Put it into cold water and heat it up and it may just stay there until it uh, dies in the boiling water. So it is subtle and people, and I haven't got an exact figure on this, but people diagnosed with COPD may well muddle along in some way, shape or form. Um, you know, sometimes better, sometimes worse for a good number of years. Uh, not surprisingly, Mr. DT has a couple of other medical problems, and that's another important thing, that when we're managing uh, COPD and trying to help patients, it's generally not in isolation. The risk factors for it, generally other risk factors for other conditions, and there's a fair likelihood that you'll be juggling um, a, a multitude, perhaps, of medical illnesses. And, of course, he's been on an assortment of, of different, uh, different inhalers with variable impact because as against with asthma, we can make reasonably good effect with, with inhalers in uh, various forms of COPD, particularly emphysema. We might make some improvement in some of the newer um, inhalers a little bit more so, but it's not quite the same, uh, the same effect. So often it's frustra it can be frustrating. It's obviously frustrating for the, for the individual and it sometimes gets a little bit frustrating for us. So it can become a little bit one of those heart sink type effects. So what's going on with Mr. DT? Oops. Symptoms are not always described. 
Shortness of breath is a relative term. Now, shortness of breath also is a function of what you attempt to do. Ask a marathon runner um, what means shortness of breath to them, and they might say, well, by the time I've run 42 Ks, I'm a little bit short of breath. Somebody with COPD, shortness of breath might mean, well, I can't even quite walk to the end of the street. And you might say, well, do you get short of breath? No. Oh, okay, fair enough. The reason they might not get short of breath is they don't do anything that makes them short of breath. So a different question can be, well, okay, that's good that you don't get short of breath. Um, how far can you walk before you, yeah, before you might get short of breath? Oh, um, well, um, yeah, probably, uh, I never really thought about it that much. So suddenly by asking a different question, you can unlock what might otherwise be hidden. So people may um, not even necessarily come in and complain of being short of breath because they have adapted themselves to the fact that they are and restrict their activities. Um, so very much, what does shortness of breath mean? And okay, we don't have to have a, a tape measure out or one of those sort of things you get from Bunnings where you can sort of measure it out and measure meters, but you know, to the front door, to the mailbox, once around the block, you know, what about if you go to the shops, by the time you're in the fourth aisle, is it a bit of a, bit of a struggle? And people will relate to that. So often, again, we have a particular language in medicine, that language is not necessarily the same one that's spoken by the patient. So putting it into terms of even in terms of meters might not mean that much. Well, if you go to the shops, um, how close you know, do you try to park to the, uh, to the entrance? Because it is a problem if you park um, you know, in the further car park. Well, yeah, it is. Uh, those sorts of things. And obviously, uh, we need to tease out other treatable causes. So somebody with COPD who might also have uh, heart failure, who might have AF, you know, who may have uh, a, a myriad or a number of other medical conditions that might be uh, exacerbating or worsening the symptoms that they do have. Obviously, if we can treat those other things, well, that's important. It's not of itself going to fix the COPD, but if we can fix other things that might make the symptoms worse, then again, we're doing a lot to, um, you know, to help that person. And Gary's spoken about how we, how we diagnose, and that's obviously important because if we don't know what we're, it's very important, if we don't know what we're dealing with, then obviously we can't do anything to improve it. But we also need to be monitoring as we go. And the analogy with the, you know, blood pressure, we do think, you know, we actually take blood pressure every time people come in, if they're being treated for high blood pressure, we're gonna check the HbA1c and diabetes, and we need to be monitoring uh, our patients with COPD. How can we do that? Notwithstanding everything I've just said, symptoms are a way of, of monitoring it. Are you able to walk any further? Do you feel that you're getting a little bit better or flipped the other way? Um, are you now finding that you can't walk even as far as you could before? Like, you know, it was once around the block you could manage, but now we're only getting halfway around the block. So there are, that's a, a you know, it's a, it's a subtle measure, but it's an indicator because it pertains to everyday life. And remember, the key thing with COPD is that it impacts and influences everything these people do in their life. I mean, I think we all know the sensation of, of being short of breath is one of the most disconcerting symptoms because it's almost existential. If you can't breathe, the next thing is, well, am I still going to be here? And when we know that, you know, we can go without um, water, food for certain periods of time, you can't go without air for very long. So that feeling of, of suffocating is, is a very existential threat. Um, so people can you know, give you some indication from their symptoms, but only if we're asking the right question, not necessarily just, are you short of breath? Um, peak flow and spirometry, I mean, peak flow is a simple thing. Spirometry, we can all do it in our practices and it's good to get the practice nurse doing that. Um, and it gives you a guide and you can see, are people getting better, are they getting worse? Sometimes if it's not getting worse, in some respects it can be getting better. So there is a tendency for, for COBD to be progressive. If we can stop it getting worse, then we're doing some, uh, some useful thing for people. And obviously a full lung function, but yeah, it doesn't have to be done as frequently. So as I've said, it does tend to be progressive um, over time. If we can stop people smoking, people say, well, I stop smoking, it'll get better. Will it get better? Well, you know what? If it doesn't get any worse, that's probably a good thing. And we know there can be some regeneration in the lungs if people do stop smoking, but you know, not getting worse is a useful start. But we do, and I really want to emphasize this from the patient perspective, is asking the right questions. Um, what is happening in your life? 
because it might not be noticed. Um, do you get short of breath playing with the grandkids? Um, no. Well, maybe that's because they're not playing with the grandkids. Um, you know, do you, how do you go with kicking a ball in the backyard? Well, I don't actually do it. Um, but if we don't ask a little bit more specifically, um, we may not. If you've adapted your life, and people are good at adapting, then they won't perceive that they've got a problem. But they've got a problem in as much as they've had to restrict what they're doing. And can we fix it all? Well, no, we can't. But if we know what's going on, we can at least try and bring about some improvement. And uh, again, Gary quoted the figure of 15,000 deaths. It, do it doesn't get me much media attraction or awareness. Um, we don't have pink ribbon days or red ribbon days or green hat days or blue something else days for COPD. It's not a particularly sexy topic. Um, different forms of cancer get a lot of awareness, heart disease gets a lot of, even you know, asthma, all these other conditions, the COPDs don't get a lot of attention. Now, why is that? Uh, look, I haven't got an answer to that one, but the fact that it doesn't get a lot of attention or awareness doesn't mean that it isn't there, but it does mean that these people can be quite hidden. And to be honest, you know, they can appear a little bit hidden to us as well. So, key points. The symptoms are not always described that well. How are you doing, Mr. DT? Yeah, I'm fine. Um, are you short of breath? No. Um, you know, did you, did you get the mail this today? And I'm, you know, mail as in like the old type that comes in the post box every third Tuesday or so these days. Um, oh, well, no, I don't do that. Um, so what does it mean to Mr. DT? So he can't really do any sporting activities. It's difficult to play with the children and or grandchildren, in, in this instance, grandchildren. Travel can be a problem. Um, getting onto a plane, he's retired, maybe he'd like to go somewhere. It's not gonna be that difficult. And not gonna be that, it's gonna be very difficult. It's not gonna be that easy. And you know, simple daily activities, he's retired, pottering around in the, in the garden, maybe um, you know, doing a bit of handyman work around the house. These are very, simple everyday activities that can be restricted in life. And if we don't ask about those things, we don't translate it into human terms, then we may not find out. Um, and look, at that point, I will wind up and pass across. Thank you. I want to take us back to Georgia for a moment that my colleague Gary told us about. So let's just remind ourselves about her. She's 56. She's got a BMI of 33, so she's certainly overweight, she's obese, she's a bit hypertensive, she has this long pack, 27 year pack history of smoking. And when we actually did her FEV1, it wasn't quite as bad as we thought it might be. She actually came in at 65% uh, uh, predicted was her FEV1. And her ratio, I never don't want to go into a lot about, C about spirometry here, but her ra ratio was less than 0.7 and there was no reversibility here. So we were clear that there wasn't any asthma. What we were dealing with was a fixed obstruction here in COPD. And so I think just going back to what Gary said, can't recommend and, and stress too highly how important it is to get that, that spirometry done. There are a lot of training courses around the country for practice nurses to come and be able to do it. And what we're talking about is using spirometry as a baseline diagnostic tool. And if you've got that fixed obstruction, you've got CAPD. If you've got reversibility and obstruction, you've got asthma. There's obviously some people in whom there's an overlap, but it certainly helps you make those, those distinctions really early. So what else do we want to know? We mentioned guidelines, and the guidelines for COPD are ones called COPDX. And even though I work in this field, they always get me down because it's a fabulous little acronym, but it doesn't quite work with the way intuitively we work as GPs. So C means case finding and confirming the diagnosis. O is optimising treatment. P is preventing deterioration. D is developing a plan. And the little x is managing exacerbations. But in fact, in general practice, we do all of them together. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six, but it's a, it's a neat little guideline. So when we're thinking about case finding and confirming the diagnosis, I want to follow on a bit from what Joe said and talk about some tools that you might find helpful in asking those questions. And then obviously here, spirometry, the magic figure of FEV1 over FVC. So how much air you can get out, 
in the first second, FEV1, compared to how much air you've got in your lungs altogether. If that's 70% or less and it's fixed, that's your COPD. So the next slide here is this, something that's called the COPD assessment tool, the CAT tool. And this is a really well validated tool. And following on from what Joe said and thinking about Georgia, this is a way that's in good patient language. It's actually available um, from that website, I think in 47 different languages. Um, patients can fill it in themselves. There are copies outside on the Novartis desk for you afterwards if you want to get it. So let, let's think about Georgia. What you've actually done is you're thinking to yourself, I need to ask these questions and partly I'm thinking, how did I miss this? When I look back over my notes, Georgia had been in a few times. She was like that patient Gary asked you about. Yeah, she did have those chest infections that took a bit of time. Mm, why didn't I pick that up? One of the interesting things is, is that we tend as doctors not to diagnose or not to think about women with COPD. There was a really neat little study done, I think probably about nine years ago in Spain, where some researchers took a, um, a little case scenario that was identical and they made some of the patients female and some of them male. And they gave it to a whole lot of doctors and said, what's your diagnosis? And interestingly, with exactly the same set of symptoms, with exactly the same everything, 80% of the doctors said the women had asthma and the men had COPD. And in fact, they all had COPD. So there's an inherent bias in us too that I think we need to be aware of. So you've, you've got over that and you're thinking about Georgia. So you're thinking, what are some questions that I can ask her? So we can say, Georgia, where are you on that cough scale? She says, well, yeah, actually, probably maybe about a two or three. Let's go for a three. Does she have much phlegm? No, maybe a two. No, chest never feels tight at all. That's again, one of those very subjective things in the way that um, Joe was talking about. <laughs> this one's quite specific. When I walk up a hill or up a flight of stairs, I am not breathless. Or number five, when I walk up a hill or a flight of stairs, I'm always breathless. She's probably about a two here. Activities at daily living, no, I can shower myself, I can get around, oh, maybe if I think about it, the vacuuming gets a bit, I get a bit puffed if I'm doing a lot of vacuuming. Yep, fine to leave home, I sleep soundly and I have lots of energy. So she ends up with a score of 14. They're the, they're the, the criteria that we're looking at. And out of that score of 40, we've got, so it's happy, starting to have a medium impact on her life. And she probably didn't think that at the start, and probably neither as her doctor did did you. Now this tool's really useful and initially, it's also really, really useful when you're monitoring people. So when they come back in, get them to repeat it. So you've got a sense of what their progression's like. Because as we said, the, the awful thing about COPD is that it is a progressive disease. So O, and I should probably have in here in the official sort of way that it's written, O is optimise uh, treatment and and optimise function and we should have P and D in here because they're all of them. Now I've got stop smoking in here because when you actually get to know Georgia, you know what? She's still smoking. And she really didn't want to tell you because she really knows she shouldn't be. But she is. So in terms of preventing further deterioration, this is the really key thing. And as we all know, people like this can be really hard to engage about their stop smoking and it often requires every, every resource we have as GPs in trying to find the thing that's going to help them. Most people take at least nine serious quit attempts before they actually stop smoking. So, I mean, my tip is here, if somebody says, oh yeah, I used to be a smoker, just probe that a little bit. Congratulations, it's really hard to give up. But, you know, most people find it really difficult and often relapse. Has that ever happened to you? So normalising it, you know, making it, it's okay to actually admit that I'm still smoking. Pulmonary rehab is really important. It's sort of a bit of a buzzword at the moment. It used to be just something that happened in tertiary hospitals, but it happens everywhere now and really important. 
immunisation, flu vaxes and pneumovax. Think about all her comorbidities, her obesity. In fact, Georgia is actually quite depressed as well. And medication. Now, I'm a fairly simple person. I always get all these new drugs muddled up. So my tip is if it ends in Ian, it's one of the llamas. And if it's one of the terols, it's one of the labas. Don't have to think any more than that. And checking inhaler technique is also really, really important. OK, so I don't know how this slides. Um, this is a stepwise guide, and we're going to talk about medication again. This is my Bible. I have this on my desk all the time, and there are copies of these for you outside. So what this goes down and says is that when we're, in fact, we've got Georgia's here in the mild level. So she's breathless on moderate exertion, but she doesn't have a lot of symptoms, little or no effect. And what we're going to do with her is probably smoking. We've talked about those. So let's just skip to medication. We'll go for a short-acting beta agonist or a short-acting muscarinic. Which one to choose? Six of one and half a dozen of the other. I like going for the beta agonist because then I can always add on a llama. If I start her on a short-acting muscarinic and then want to move her on, I can't do a llama, but I can do a LABA. So, I mean, it really doesn't matter, but the thing is you can't use a short-acting muscarinic and a long-acting together, whereas you can, obviously, in asthma with the others. We see Georgia, um, let's say, we start her on this, we review her in four to six weeks, and it's, yeah, she's a bit better, but not that much better. So let's think about starting her on one of the long acting. So that's the next step wise. And the theory about this is you go up to the steps till you get good symptom control. And I don't have very long left, but we see her five years later. You've sent her off. In fact, she's seen a really helpful psychologist and she stopped smoking and she's dealing with the depression. She's generally feeling much better about her life, but her symptoms have got worse. And our next step then when with, with moderates is to think about if we've used her on one of the long-acting muscarinics or one of the long-acting BDACs is actually putting the two together. And there's evidence that the two together in the combination is more effective than monotherapy. And there's also good evidence that these long-actings actually help prevent exacerbation um, as well as relieving the symptoms. So through all those, you'll see there are two key messages. One is that the pharmacological medications are really important, but the non-pharmacological ones are too. There's a little guide to these on the back with all the pictures of the current ones. So COPD is really multifaceted in terms of how it's symptoms for people and multi, oh, multi-management. But this is what we GPs are really good at. This is the sort of thing we deal with all the time. And it's not only their COPD, it's all the other comorbidities. And there's a jigsaw of management that we have to fit together for these patients. And you saw by the slide on the back of this, there are a plethora of medications and devices. So, so the real hint is, let just be really simple about stepwise. You start with the, the short acting, move to a long acting, move to a combination. Don't use inhaled corticosteroids for COPD at all, unless you're really, really at the end and you're trying to prevent exacerbations. Okay, so, so inhaled corticosteroids by themselves don't have a place. The other thing is try to be consistent in the, in the devices that you're using. You know, there was an amazing veteran study where 15% of these veterans who were aged over 75 were using five different devices. Now, you know, as people get older and all the, the problems there. So really, if you, it, it's complex, but it's simple. And, and as I said, being a simple person, if you just started in that, that, that way, but the keys are the things that we're good at. Bring people back let them feel comfortable about talking to you, check what their symptoms are and engage them in the management plan with you. And obviously things, there are templates about GP management plans and things to help this. And it's not just us as GPs, there's a team involved in, in, in the non-pharmacological management. Thanks very much.
Thank you. So, I mean, what I take away from that, I mean, I love measuring things. And I think if you could measure things, it gives you a sense of whether you're actually improving or not. And so if you actually, you know, use the questionnaires, use spirometry, it will give you a sense of where you're going. So I think it was a great talk. We are, with med talks, there's often talks about what does the future hold? So if you had a crystal ball, or even now, what may be happening now, it's great to see what's coming over the horizon. So we're really lucky to have um, Professor Grant Waterer, who is a respiratory physician at the Royal Perth Hospital, a professor of medicine at the University of WA, and also at the Northwestern University of Chicago. And so he's very well published, fantastic, and he'll actually be sharing insights of the new and emerging option for management of COPD. So um, Professor Waterer. Oh. Thank you. Um, so this is a very different format for me. Ten minutes to try and tell you everything I um, know about emerging um, options. Hopefully they didn't select me as a specialist because they thought all I know would fit into ten minutes. Um, right. So I think at the moment, if you're confu specialists are confused, so I'm sure you're confused. And a lot of what we have now is emerging data around the group of patients with more moderate to severe disease. And do you choose two bronchodilators, a LAMA and a LAVA, or do you choose an ICS LAVA? Um, and we've got a number of studies that have come out and a number that are just about to come out um, in informing this. But if it's clear that if you go back, let's say, even five years ago, probably in the COPD group, you would have about a third of patients on, on Spiriva, Teotropium alone, and about three quarters of half to three quarters of patients were on um, an ICS larva. As you look at all the data now, um, now that we have dual bronchodilators, probably two thirds of those patients that were on an ICS larva should be on a larva lama, and only about a third should be on an ICS larva. So we have FLAME. Uh, FLAME was a study done by Novartis, um, which looked at um, patients with COPD. It had, a, had had quite a lot of exclusion criteria and, and an important one I'll come to in a minute. But it was a head-to-head -head study of indicatorol and glycoperonium, which you know as Ultrabro, versus salmeterol uh, fluticasone, which you would call serotide. Um, and quite interestingly, in uh, certainly all patients and the moderate um, to severe patients, um, the exacerbation rate was actually lower in the dual bronchodilator group than in the ICS LABA group. Um, not so much difference in the severe group, but in the severe group they had an awful lot of exacerbations. Um, and leading on from this now is we've got three companies all uh, within the next 18 months going to try and get approval for triple therapy in one device. You've got GSK who uh, are trying to for fluticasone ferroate, valantrol and eumeclidinium. Uh, in their device, you've got Novartis with Mometazone, that's their inhaled corticosteroid, um, Indicatorol and Glycoperonium, and then AstraZeneca have uh, Budesonide, Ephemoterol, and a new la 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 uh, Lama. So the question will become, which patients do you use all three drugs, and which do you stay on two drugs? And we have a bit of data on that. Um, first of all, there's quite an old study now, 10 years old, um, of the optimal study, which studied uh, Spiriva, with, Spiriva with, with, with Salmeterol and Spiriva with um, Serotide. Um, and in that study, um, there was no significant difference uh, for the primary endpoint of exacerbations, but there was less hospitalizations in patients who were on triple therapy. A very recent study uh, published in the last eight months, the Trilogy study published in Lancet, looked at triple therapy in a single inhaler Budesonide, Ephemoterol and Glycoperonium versus Budesonide and Formoterol. So that's Simbacort really versus um, Simbacort plus Glycoperonium in quite a large number of patients. No difference in lung function or breathlessness, but quite a significant difference in exacerbations. And then we have the Wisdom study um, that was published a few years ago. And this was quite an interesting study. This took patients who were on all drugs they put them effectively onto triple therapy and then stepped them down to either serotide or serotide plus teotropium for a year. And there was no difference in the exacerbation rates 
between those two groups. There was a small reduction in lung function in those who came off the ICS, but no change in exacerbations. Again, supporting that the combination um, of two bronchodilators is probably at least as good um, as the ICS plus LAVA combination. But the, uh, really the evolving area, and I think this is going to be what you're going to be doing in your practice within a few years, um, if not sooner, is that peripheral eosinophilia so, and, and we're not talking about masses of eosinophilia here like you get with the vasculitis or a Churg Strauss um, but, or you know, severe allergies, but peripheral eosinophilia, more than 2% in a whole lot of studies, and I'm just going to quickly walk through these, is probably what determines the subgroup of patients with an ICS larva who will benefit from the ICS component of that. So if you look, for example, um, at the study by PASCO at L two years ago, this was a sub-analysis of the new studies for Brio, so fluticasone, furoate and volantrol versus volantrol alone. And if you look there, what you see is if you had a peripheral eosinophilia less than 2%, there was really no difference between the two arms in terms of exacerbations. But as your exacerbation, a, as your eosinophilia went up, the, the advantage in have being on fluticasone um, as well as volantrol got larger and larger and larger. So the more eosinophilia you had, the more advantage you got out of an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, if we look at the same data for Simbacort, also published a couple of years ago, you see the same thing. Slightly different um, ways that they measured eosinophils. This equates to roughly 1.5%, uh, 2.5% uh, and up to 6%. And again, you see that as the peripheral eosinophilia goes up, the difference between the group that has um, uh, the inhaled corticosteroid with the long-acting beta agonist gets larger and larger and larger. And then finally from the WISDOM trial, the one I just showed you where comparing uh, salmeterol and teotropium with uh, serotide, show in a sub-analysis they showed that, um, and what you're looking at here is uh, increasing amounts of peripheral eosinophilia, that the gap between, it for exacerbations, gets larger and larger again in those um, who had a larger eosinophilia. Me meaning that um, if you had more eosinophilia, you got more exacerbations if you were taken off the inhaled corticosteroid. Okay, so this whole concept that peripheral eosinophilia, a simple blood test, might be a really useful marker for deciding which of that one third of patients should be on an ICS LABA versus combination of treatment, um, or perhaps even triple therapy, um, is really this the sort of cutting edge for us. There's a whole lot of stuff that your patients will come to you from the internet around monoclonal antibodies. Uh, there's a whole lot of anti-IL-5 antibodies. Mepolizumab's now available in Australia for asthma. There's another couple of um, uh, anti-IL-5s. They're all being trialled in COPD. Um, they all show some efficacy, but whether or not we're going to be able to afford them is going to be the interesting uh, question. There's anti-IL-13, uh, anti-IL-4, and these are all Anti-IL-5 and anti-IL-4 are all targeted at eosinophilic type inflammation. Anti-IL-13 is, is, is a bit more generic TH1 uh, type inflammation. Um, and they're all you know, vaguely similar, but perhaps small step improvements on omelizumab. Um, at the moment, these are not uh, available for COPD. I'm not sure how much impact they'll have. Certainly in asthma, they're likely to have a significant impact at the severe end, but just be aware that these are all around and your patients may bring uh, you, you know, trials that, that, that come from the internet. Um, antibiotics as well um, are entering into um, uh, the stage where we have data telling us which patients might benefit from antibiotic strategies in COPD. This is the paper published uh, about five years ago where they used azithromycin in COPD and showed that patients on azithromycin had significantly less exacerbations. Another trial, the Columbus trial, again published a few years ago, um, uh, only a few years ago, showing that in patients who were um, on azithromycin, significantly less exacerbations. And what we know is that if you take a patient who's had three exacerbations in the last year, and you do a CT scan, you'll find bronchiectasis in about two thirds of them. Um, and what we believe is that a lot of this benefit of antibiotics, uh, particularly macrolides, is probably driven by uh, that subgroup of patients who have bronchiectasis, and certainly that subgroup who have chronic bacteria in their sputum. As GPs, I would not recommend starting any patient on a chronic macrolide antibiotic. Uh, 
without getting specialist advice, but it's very clear that macrolide antibiotics, not for their antibiotic effect, but for their anti-inflammatory effects and their um, also some, some uh, immunomodulatory effects in the lung as well, um, in a subgroup of patients seem to do very well. And some of you may have noticed in the news just recently that the, uh, the, the group in Newcastle have shown that in severe asthmatics who um, have a lot of exacerbations, the same thing. So this again is sort of cutting edge of what we're, we're expecting to see is that some patients with COPD, particularly those with frequent exacerbations, are likely to end up on chronic macrolide therapy. Now, it's been mentioned a few times that patients are relatively asymptomatic and present, can present late. But the more data we get, the more we know that we need to act earlier in COPD, hence the importance of getting the diagnosis right. Um, this comes from uh, a paper published uh, just in the last uh, few months, um, looking at uh, the, the classes of um, COPD based on spirometry and what effect uh, did exacerbations have o over time. Um, and you can see here that in gold zero, so this is patients really um, who are completely as asymptomatic, have only very uh, mild spirometry, um, that there's, in those who have exacerbations, there's a small drop in lung function. But once you get to mild symptoms, the biggest drop, okay, the biggest drop in lung function is in patients who have the mildest symptoms and the mildest change in FEV1. Why is that? Because by the time you get to end stage disease with very low FEV1s, there's not much the, the way the lung can respond. But early in disease, you get very large drops in lung function with exacerbations that don't recover. So you need to get to patients early and prevent their exacerbations if they're having them because that's when you can make the most difference to their long-term outcome. Um, and we've known this for some time. This, is, this comes from the TORCH study um, over a decade ago now. And I don't know if the numbers came up here. They didn't. Um, but what you can, this group here is the group who had the, the mildest um, lung function at onset, um, uh, at, sorry, the mildest on, uh, uh, onset here. This is moderate, this is severe. Um, this is the placebo group in pink. And what you can see here is that the biggest drop in lung function over the study was in those who had the mildest lung function at onset. And by the time you got to severe lung function, a much smaller drop in lung function. Again, don't wait for bad lung function to treat these patients optimally. You've got to get them while they're early. Um, everyone wants to be a surgeon, even physicians. Um, so, you know, we're playing with things like endobronchial valves. Uh, those of you who have been around long enough will, will remember lung volume reduction surgery and all the cardiothoracic surgeons thought that was going to be their own Greek island that they were going to buy. Um, and it turned out, in actual fact, that we probably killed more patients um, than we wanted with lung volume reduction surgery, and the net effect is not particularly large. Bronchial valves are one thing that, pa that people are playing with at the moment. They're quite expensive. They're about $14,000 a device. Um, uh, I think there's probably a very narrow subset of patients who might benefit from it. But if, if you're really interested, there are probably clinical trials that you can meet, get patients enrolled in. Um, but it's very, very um, limited number of patients that you can really target these things in who have a quite asymmetric um, kind of emphysema because you, you want to be able to block off narrow lung, uh, a damaged lung, not lung that's also a bit normal. Um, the other thing that's been going on uh, with this um, is also steam. The other approach is to put a catheter down, direct s hot steam basically, and cause uh, limited fibrosis in an area of lung. Those are the two things that people who like to play with tools are playing with at the moment that again your patient may, may come to you. And there are a few people in Perth who are doing this um, in, in clinical trials. Finally, um, it's been talked about monitoring. There are two things. Firstly, spirometers are getting easier and simpler. This is quite a nice uh, new one. Novartis has got a loan program. There'll be some people at the back, I'm sure, to show you. But these just plug into iPhones. Um, and it's a very simple way to do screening spirometry. For myself, actually, I don't find spirometry very useful once I've made the diagnosis of COPD. But it's absolutely essential to make the diagnosis of COPD. What I think is um, also very um, useful now, th this is quite an expensive kind of monitor that you can put on your wrist that measures activity and sleep and all of that. But all of our iPhones now measure your activity, how far you walk. And it was mentioned earlier, COPD is not a sexy disease. I mean, you don't hear people sitting around at dinner parties talking about my FEV1 was 1.4, what was yours, right? 
but they do sit there and they do compare their blood pressure. I mean, how many times have you, have you heard people, oh, well, my blood pressure was 200 on 100, or, oh, well, mine was 220 on 130. People love comparing steps, all right? Um, I did 3,400 today, really? Well, I did 13,000. People love that aspect of it. And because you can get printouts on your, uh, from your iPhone and you can look at it longitudinally, this is a fantastic way to look at people's activity. So if you're not sure about, you know, how, in this one of these group of people who their symptoms are, are vague, um, they're a bit vague, I'll, I'll bet they'll have an iPhone or, a, or a, some kind of tablet device that will measure their steps and go and have a, just have a look at it or then ask them to get one and measure it. Um, measuring people's change in exercise is incredibly useful, particularly if you're asking questions like, well, I've just put you on a new Lava Llama. Is it any better than the one you were on? Well, I'm not sure, doctor. Well, look at what happened to their, st their activity and get them use that to help encourage more activity, okay? So technology. Technology is that this is going to be your friend. It will make things easier. Oh, that's an, that's an Actigraph. It's a, a, it's a, it's a commercial um, product, but you don't, you don't need it. I'm just putting it up there to, sh to show that that is, that is just one of the forms of technology you can use. Um, all right, thank you very much. You know, it's interesting how within medicine, everything is moving to treating earlier, earlier and earlier. So obviously getting that diagnosis before um, the main issues is really, really important. Now comes the fun part of the evening. I said it was going to be an innovative way of asking questions. Well, does anyone want to have a guess what this is? This is the Powerball. Whoever holds this has the absolute right to ask the question. No one else may talk over them until they have finished. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to throw it in a minute into the audience and then you can actually use it. And what I'll do is I'll alternate between the ball and then what's coming up on the, the screen. So I'll ask all our speakers to come back on the stage if they may. And while they're doing it, um, do we have someone? Or actually, before I throw it in the audience, there was one question that I thought was really important to answer straight away. If it selects, no, okay. Um, Praveen asked a specific question. Spirometry, oh, it's gone now. Oh, yeah. Spirometry has been bandied as the go-to test for diagnosis of COPD. But in experience, it's not very helpful. What's the sensitivity and specificity of spirometry? Team. Um, yep. um, well, I, I think you know, it's effectively 100% sensitive in that you can't make the diagnosis of COPD without abnormal spirometry. Um, uh, if the spirometry is normal, look for another diagnosis. I think what confuses people is that um, the patient we saw was a little abnormal, okay, in that she had no bronchodilator response whatsoever. That's a bit of a uh, contrivance to make it easier to talk about her. If you look at um, trials of, of Spiriva, the average improvement that patients got with the bronchodilator with COPD was about um, 60 to 80 mils. If you look at combination Lava Lamas, um, then the average improvement that patients are getting is about 120 to 130 mils. With that level of bronchodilator response, you'd have been excluded from all of the old trials of COPD. So it's actually normal to get some bronchodilator response with COPD. Um, you'll see that nine times out of ten. Um, the key is that um, uh, it's, it's around the other clinical factors of the diagnosis, and then it's around their response to treatment. So, you know, yes, very occasionally, you're not sure if someone's got asthma or COPD, so you treat them aggressively if they're asthma and you see what happens to their lung function. But most times, it's, it, it's going to be significant history of smoking, all the other factors are going to make you think that it's COPD. But um, I, I suspect that's what the question is getting at, is that it's normal to see some bronchodilation and, and have perhaps a modicum of confusion, especially in a younger patient. But I think, I think our asthma diagnosis is that you've got a significant um, 
reversibility and 400 mils or 12 to 15 percent depending on who who you're following so the numbers that you're talking about don't move you into that that category diagnostically can i sorry just add one yeah. one yeah. last thing as somebody who's done spirometry training for a very long time i think the problem is not so much the spirometry as a test it's one of it, what's unique about spirometry is you need a perfect performance by both the subject and the person doing the test. Now, I see a number of people nodding their heads because I suspect all of you have either done spirometry on yourselves or tried to administer it to someone else. It's, when it's done well, it's a very, very useful test. Unfortunately, it is often not done well. And that's why if it's not something that you do often enough, that's fine. Just make sure that somebody else does it. Uh, you know, a, 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 an experienced uh, respiratory technician, uh, respiratory scientist, will do a fantastic job. They will get a performance out of a patient that nobody else could possibly do. And then the test is a very robust and useful test. So, do I have a taker for the Powerball? <laughs> Who's gonna be first? Or do I just throw, oh, here we go. <coughs> um, the ears well, yeah, you have to speak into the black part of it. Oh, the black part, right. Oh, that's actually a microphone as well as a magic yeah. ball. With regard to the ear xenophilia, you were talking about a percentage. Is that the ear xenophil count over the total white cell count? Correct. It's the percentage of ear xenophils right. as a proportion of the white cells. So it's a simple thing we can get off a standard FBC. Yep, standard FBC. Um, it's not yet part of the guidelines. So, you know, again, I'm showing you kind of cutting edge mm -hmm. what, what a specialist talking about. I've certainly moved to doing that in my own yeah. clinical practice. Yeah. I find it quite useful. So you think it's robust enough? You know, uh, after all, it's not... I mean, we have to make that clinical decision well, anyway, so it, what, it's what we don't have, reasonable for us to do that. Yeah, look, uh, what we don't have is a randomised controlled trial that randomises people based on their ears in the field count into two arms, all right? What we've got is retrospective studies that say, in retrospect, that's what it looks like. So until we've got that randomised prospective trial, it, it isn't a slam dunk, but given that we've all got a bit of confusion around this, mm. and given the data that's out there, it seems like if you're really not sure, it will help tip you in one direction or the other. Now we'll have one. You get to hold the ball until we throw it to somebody else. So, um, next question. And look, we we're talking about how the impacts are on people. Sorry, it's not working. So look, the cutoff spirometry reading and oxygen levels for patients being unfit for flight. So, you know, COPD, moderately short of breath. Are they, you know, they come with their nice little you know, medical insurance form, which I'm sure you've all seen when they've gone travelling. What are the cutoffs before we're allowed to say that they can fly? When is it going to be a problem? Um, well, there's no cutoff for spirometry. Um, the, the issue, of course, is that flight, most, most airliners, apart from the, the 777, all pressurised to about 3,000 metres. So, you know, if I put a pulse oximeter on my finger, um, I'm normally about 97 at sea level, um, at, at altitude in a 747, I'm about 92, 93. Um, uh, so if you start off with a low pulse, a low oximetry, it's going to go even lower. So what I say to people is, um, uh, it's it's a function of both your oxygen at rest, um, and certainly if your oxygen saturation is less than 92 percent at rest, you're at risk. And it's also a function of the distance of the flight. Um, so if it's a relatively short flight, Sydney to Melbourne. That, that's probably fine, but you know, if, if it's a longer flight, then the fact becomes, and you've also got to get up and walk to the bathroom. So I tell, I, I tell um, if my uh, GPs, and, and certainly for my patients, if you're at 92%, if you're less than 92% at rest, or if you get up and walk to the end of my corridor and back, and you drop below 92, then what you need to do is actually have a flight, a, an altitude simulation test, which uh, is done in, in most areas in, co in comprehensive labs and what they'll do is they'll put oxygen on the patient at the level they're going to get at altitude and see what happens to them at rest and when they exercise mm -hmm. and also determine how much oxygen they need to get over that because it's not just a case of do you need oxygen or not it's how much oxygen you need because um, airlines can only supply a limited amount of oxygen and if it's a long flight you're then talking cylinders and things like that so simple rule of thumb Less than 92% get an altitude simulation test. Uh, if they walk up and down the corridor and drop to below 92%, get an altitude simulation test. Okay, well, um, you see, you always learn something when you come to these talks. Now, the Powerball. So who's going for, who wants to ask the question with the Powerball? Who wants the power? 
I mean, we've had great talks. There must be, I mean, this is a big area. No questions at all? Oh, yes, we're right at the very front. So do, do a, a sl off, off, off the backboard. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking to the black, yep. I'm an old, old enough to have grown up in the days when GPs often put their uh, chronic respiratory patients onto tetracyclines long term. Yep. That went out of favour. We're now going to azithromycin. So we're talking about the macrolides. What do you think about using the tetracyclines? Um, so, so interestingly, tetracyclines probably have some of the same immunomodulatory properties as macrolides, um, but they've simply not been studied. So if you go with the evidence, um, you, would, you would use a macrolide because we don't have any evidence um, for tetracyclines other than a few retrospective studies in the 50s and the 60s. Um, uh, personally, I, I use a lot of doxycycline um, in my patients with bronchiectasis um, because it's, as you know, easy to get. You get the 25 tablets, five repeats on, on the PBS. But in the setting of this difficult group of patients with COPD and a lot of exacerbations, um, I think we'll be using macrolides until someone does a study of tetracycline simply because there is no data to support it. Okay, so now one from the, 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 the iPad. And I think this is a, actually a really good one. What is the best marker to assess the improvement and the need to change medication? So we, we've been told what medications that we can use. How do you judge which medication you should be using? Oh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm happy to start that one and obviously join in. I think... Um, I mean, I don't think there is a simple answer what is the best marker. Grant said he doesn't use spirometry or particularly find it helpful in terms of monitoring progress, but that is one tool. I personally find that CAT tool quite a useful way of progressively following um, how a patient's going. So it's a, it's, a me it's a measure of what measurements you can take plus the patient's symptoms. How's the patient actually going in their life and what you need to change medication? The other thing, though, that I think makes COPD different is the other important factor is the number of exacerbations that they've had. So I think those three things, symptoms, exacerbations and spirometry would be the three measures I would use and make me think about whether I needed to change medication. Yeah, so, so I think, I think just on, on in, in relation to the spirometry, I think it's important to make the point that um, there really is not such great correlation between spirometry um, results, in other words, objective measurements and symptoms. So, uh, you know, you, you may get a patient who gets very good response from a short-acting beta agonist, which might have something to do with the uh, resistance to airflow, uh, but which may not be measurable on, on, uh, on spirometry. Um, so I think, for me, spirometry would be very good in terms of tracking long-term decline. Unfortunately, as we get older, everything declines and lung function, even in people who don't have COPD, declines. But with people with COPD, it may decline more rapidly, even when they've given up smoking. So I think it is important, uh, I think it is an important tool, but possibly not so much in terms of the uh, response to medication. But I do agree with you that it's really, it's about function. And, and whereas with asthma, we try to uh, normalize lung function as, as much as possible, we would like to restore normal lung function. Uh, one of the important things that our patients need to understand is that we're not going to do that. We're not going to give them back their normal lungs. What we're going to do is try and improve their functional status. Okay, so we're, we're actually fastly running out of time. I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. So do we, another question from the audience. Come on, who wants the Powerball? It's supposed to be innovative and excite you. <laughs> no? No no takers? Last, you know? Oh, uh, look, I, I won't be able to do a, a, a rebound on this one. Here we go. Oh. Whoa! <laughs> 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 Nearly got her. <laughs> okay, so speaking to the black part of the ball. Actually, my question is pretty much that question over there. What is the role of inhaled steroids in COPD not in the acute session? So, chronic use of inhaled corticosteroids. Yeah, so I, I think the guidelines are <coughs> fairly clear on this. Uh, the evidence that you've heard would indicate that uh, 
the preference in terms of escalating treatment from one long-acting long bronchodilator rather than adding inhaled corticosteroids, which is what we did uh, several years ago, is to add another long-acting bronchodilator. So you might have a llama uh, LABA combination, uh, doesn't matter which one you started with, you just add the one you didn't have. Um, inhaled corticosteroids uh, have been shown to be useful in frequent exacerbators. So how do you define frequent exacerbation? More than two exacerbations per annum. Um, just be mindful that there certainly is some persistent evidence in many of the studies that if you add inhaled corticosteroids, you do increase the risk uh, of pneumonia. So not only do we need to look at the potential benefits we offer, but also the safety and potential harm we might cause. Okay, any other takers on that one? No? No. Unfortunately, I'm sorry, this is, uh, we've run out of time for the questions here, but I'd like to thank our speakers for their contribution and their fantastic <laughs> presentation.